back to the award-winning podcast, The Lone Star Collective, the official podcast of the Texas Cannabis Collective. I'm your host, Gramps, Chris Grisolia, and I'm joined this week by our co-host and executive director, Austin Zam Hariri, and our other board members that's joining us this week, Josh Kassoff. Welcome, guys. All right. Excited to have Josh here. It's um, always a Always a blessing to to have Josh um, show up and and provide insight and just excited to kind of use this time uh, as an opportunity to discuss your adventures in cannabis, your involvement in our team, and uh, you know your pursuits in Vegas as well. So Josh, thank you for being here, brother. Of course, Absolutely. thank you for having me. Much welcome to you, sir. Josh, so. You know, uh, and I, I love this. Um, I love this because um, you are a founding board member of the Texas Cannabis Collective. There were only five of us originally, um, but really four of us that, you know, through the whole process, you remember in the summer of 2021, um, we were working really hard. It feels like we were ma- meeting weekly, bi-weekly, figuring out how to turn this entity into a nonprofit. And in fact, your relationship with us goes all the way back to 2018 when I believe you were still here in Texas, correct? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I remember I met you at, uh, I don't know if it was some normal events or just some other- No, know, it was Dalton. It was one of Dalton's yeah. events. Yeah, Dalton. Dalton's events. And I remember you saying you had this site and you wanted some cannabis writers. And I was looking for really any way to get my articles out there. So I was still so new to it. And so you definitely offered me a fantastic opportunity. Yeah. And so, so I, and then, you know, it kind of blossomed from there. Um, you've been writing for us. You wrote for us in the 2019 legislative session, the 2021 legislative session. Uh, you had a really rock star uh, interview with Ag Commission, Texas Ag Commissioner Sid Miller in this legislative session. Yeah. So, man, we've got a lot of, you know, Josh Kassoff, Texas Cannabis Collective, Austin Z. We all we have a very, very long relationship. And so um, just thankful that, you know, even though you're a medical marijuana refugee living in Las Vegas, your home is here in Texas and you're still dedicated to it. And so just kudos yeah. to you, brother. Texas is where my heart still is, you know. So tell us, tell us about your, you know, tell us about how you started out really in Texas and how you got to Las Vegas. Um, so, you know, like many people who use cannabis, I started in college. Then, you know, I grew up similarly in Texas, uh, you know, very Bible Belty, very, uh, you know, cannabis is devil, cannabis is you know, you try it once and you'll go down a horrible path in life. And so that's what I was raised under. The D.A.R.E. program, if you remember the D.A.R.E. program. Yeah. Um, how wonderfully effective the D.A.R.E. program has been, right? <laughs> we, we, we've all let that lion down. That, that poor lion, we've all, we've all let him down. Um, but so I grew up under that. And I just, I knew the people in high school who were smoking weed. I, I just wasn't really that like close of friends with them. So I just, we didn't, never hung out. So I never did it. I had nothing against it even in high school. It was just, I never did it because no one I knew did it. Um, then when I got to college, on the other hand, you know, that's when that changed. And so I started <laughs> using it in college. I didn't really. Where'd you go to college? It. UNT, Mean Green. All right. Rep that Mean Green. Yeah, um, we decriminalized out there, baby. Absolutely. We, yeah. We tried to. Know. We're still working on it. <laughs> it's text politics, right? Texas yes. lawmaking, it goes like that. Um, but yeah, it's and it was an honor to cover the decriminalization efforts out there as well. Um, but I didn't really view cannabis as anything other than I would smoke it and feel funny in college. Like I didn't, I didn't actually see it as like, oh, medically it helps with this and that. I just, it, it was there, and I smoked it because I liked it. Um, <laughs> And then, so afterwards, uh, you know, graduated UNT around 2015, uh, interned at Disney World, long story short. As I'm sure you're aware, it was not a very enjoyable time. Uh, My mental health deteriorated, to say it nicely, while I was there. Um, 
And that's what I noticed when I did smoke it in Disney World, not in the parks, but while I was working there, um, that I would be like so freaked out and anxious and like angry about everything and all the guest interactions I had every day. And so I'd meet up with some people I worked with after and we'd smoke and just all that anger, all that anxiety, all that just like, you know, getting so worked up in your head. Cannabis made all of that go away. And I never felt that before. Like alcohol didn't do that. Um, no, nothing else that I had tried in college did that besides cannabis. And so that's when I thought, okay, there's, there's something behind this. I knew other states had medical cannabis, but, you know, journalism wasn't even in my future at this time. I just always knew that I liked it. And uh, so uh, afterwards, um, you know, graduated, worked a little in Dallas, um, got laid off, dealt with unemployment a lot. And while I was dealing with unemployment, that's when I was prescribed the pharmaceuticals, the Abilify, Cymbalta, Wellbutrin. Uh, I realized just how much mentally those, those pills just like messed with my head. It made the mood swings, the panic attacks. It just made it a thousand times worse. Um, but when I would use cannabis, panic attacks would go away, mood swings would go away. I'd be friendly again. I'd be, you know, hospitable again. I'd want to cook a meal for me and my best friend. I'd want to get out and go interact and go hang out with friends and go to parties and, you know, concerts and everything. And so I just felt like cannabis really gave me my life back in a way that the pharmaceuticals and alcohol definitely did not. Um, and so eventually I just swore off the pharmaceuticals forever. And so that's when I got into journalism as well. I've always enjoyed writing, reading literature, um, and storytelling. And I, you know, but I, the reason I didn't study journalism in college was because, oh, I just thought that meant, oh, you're on your local cable station or you're working for CNN or Fox news, like one of the yeah. mainstream media stations. And I didn't really want to do that. I didn't picture myself doing that. Um, and so I didn't major in journalism, but then I started to realize that, well, every article written for Rolling Stone, Vice, you know, these counterculture magazines that may be a little more corporatized now, but certainly started in the counterculture scene. Um, all of those articles are journalism as well. And journalism has been a tremendous tool for social change as well and giving a voice to those who may have otherwise been voiceless. And so what, that's when I started to realize that there's something behind journalism. There's something behind the written word. And so that's when I started covering, you know, I got uh, contracted on a really small site. And so that's when I started covering cannabis related matters. And uh, I started covering law, politics. It was when we, me and some friends took a trip out here to Vegas, actually, in the summer of 2017. I went to my first dispensary. I picked up my first issue of Vegas Cannabis Magazine, which is who I write for now. And uh, a phenomenal uh, publication, just like Texas Cannabis Collective. And, um, and we went to a, you know, I mentioned my first dispensary and I just saw the industry and how, uh, you know, like, amazing, I don't want to say amazing, but just the stores are magnificent. There's so much product. You can buy edibles, vape pens, flour, pre-rolled joints, concentrates, RSO, just how varied all the products are. It was incredible. And um, so after I went back to Texas, that's when I realized like maybe I might want to move out to Vegas at some point. And uh, so yeah, that's when I met uh, a year or so after I started writing about cannabis was when I met you, Austin, um, and Dalton, and everyone, and started making those Dallas connections. And then eventually, a few months after that, I realized that in a very gonzo approach, sort of like Hunter S. Thompson almost, the best way to cover the cannabis industry would be moving out to a state where it's legal already and working in the industry and writing about what's going on and meeting the advocates, meeting the power players in the industry and covering what's going on there. And uh, so I, you know, I took a tremendous leap of faith. It was, I know, you know, I didn't really know anyone out here. I didn't have a job lined up. I didn't have, I, I, the only housing I had was through a fraternity Facebook group. So it was very much like, I didn't know what I was getting into. I was jumping into the unknown. Um, I knew it was gonna kind of be like the wild west a little because, you know, the industry is still federally illegal. And, you know, no matter how established a state's industry is, it's still federally illegal. And so there's many disadvantages sure. and problems that arise from that. Um, but I decided to make the move out here. And I, you know, I'm really glad I did. Um, yeah, I hit the ground running um, with, uh, 
getting my agent card in Nevada, for instance. So Nevada, when it comes to legal states, is the most strictly regulated of all the legal states. Like it is, it, it is excessive. It is. I will admit. You know, I a, an industry especially as young as cannabis does need to be re, uh, well regulated, but it's excessive at some point, and this is excessive. One of the ways which Nevada cannabis is unnecessarily regulated is so there's a variety of roles in a cultivation facility, for instance, trimmers, packagers, people who work with the plants, the people who drive the delivery vans. There's so many different people who work in a cultivation. Um, but in Nevada cannabis, there could be up to five different licenses that an employee could need. Um, it's unlikely, uh, it's unlikely you would need all five, but you may, if you're like a business owner, you might need all five. Um, but yeah, if you work with only flour, then you need one license. If you work with concentrates or the vape pens or edibles, for instance, you need another license. If Josh, you, let, do me do me a favor. Let's uh, let's let's pick up this discussion about about what you started learning about Vegas cannabis on the other side of our break. Okay. Yeah, we need to take a sponsor break right quick, and okay. uh, yeah, when we get back, we'll dive into to all those those interesting aspects that you were starting to to un, unfold for us there, right after okay. right after our sponsor break. So we're going to take a quick sponsor break, folks, and when we get back, we're going to do just that. We're going to dive in all the ins and outs of of what Josh has learned while living in Vegas about the cannabis can or the Vegas cannabis program, right after this. You should attend the Fuck Cancer Party. It's a fundraiser for some patients. An ABC dance party where you bring a friend with you. It's being hosted by Mary J. July 29th is the day. 6 to 9 p.m. You should head out that way. 2110 South Lamar, Austin, Texas ain't that far. You could get there in your car and bring a friend. You can get tickets and information if you go on the browser and visit our website, visit texascanico.com forward slash events, find out more information and buy tickets. Join us on August 17th for the Texas Cannabis Roundup in Fort Worth, Texas at the Longhorn Ice House. This will be an industry networking event featuring speakers in a robust Texas style venue. The event starts at 5.15 p.m. and will last until 9.45 p.m. Visit TexasCannabisRoundup.com to get tickets today. So you can join us at the Longhorn Ice House on August 17th at 5 p.m. Howdy, Colt Power here. These days, many people are choosing to add CBD to their wellness routine. Why? Some like CBD for how it may help them with their focus. Others enjoy the way the plant compound may assist them with their sore muscles and relaxation. For me, CBD has been a game changer in keeping my old sports injuries managed so I can work out and be present for my family. If you've ever been curious about CBD, I invite you to check out our Texas-grown, Texas-made products at PowerBioFarms.com. That's Power, B-I-O-P-H-A-R-M-S.com. Thrive Apothecary offers an experience truly unique from anything else in Texas. A full-service cannabis solution that is doctor-owned and offers customers every level of cannabis legally available in Texas. From traditional CBD products to emerging hemp-derived THC edibles, smokables, and now medical cannabis. As a licensed medical cannabis provider, prospective patients from anywhere in Texas can book a sponsored online eligibility consultation to determine if they qualify for a medical marijuana prescription from the comfort of their own home. Visit thrivetx.com for more information. Welcome back to the Lone Star Collective Podcast, the official podcast of the Texas Cannabis Collective, distributed on Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, and many more to give Texans information regarding policy, industry, and culture. And now, Back to this week's show. To the Lone Star Collective, the award-winning podcast of the Texas Cannabis Collective. I'm your host, host Gramps Chris Grisolio, and I'm joined this week by our co-host and executive director, Austin Zamhariri, 
and our other board member who's joining us this week to talk about Vegas, Josh Kassoff. Welcome back, guys. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so, for having me. You bet. So you were you were starting to dive into all the ins and outs of of the whole Vegas cannabis scene yeah. and how it's it's kind of overregulated, but how that's kind of necessary. Go back into that and, and elaborate yeah. a little more for us. So it, it's it's necessary to an extent, definitely. Um, one of the systems that is required to be used out here is called Metric uh, Marijuana Enforcement Tracking recording i forget the full uh acronym of metric but it's yeah. a program everyone in the industry uses out here i'm sure you're aware something like that i feel like is necessary it's a lot of paperwork it's a lot of data entry it's a lot of you know office work but i feel like something like that you know inventory tracking i guess inventory tracking is important absolutely you know what plant goes from the you know grow house what buds are collected from that where, you know, where that goes into packaging and everything, that level of inventory tracking, I definitely think is necessary. But I was mentioning like the five licenses you might need, the background checks you'd have to go through. Until yeah. recently, uh, excluded felony offenses were a big issue as well. So if you're in Nevada and you have a any type of felony on your record, originally, for the most part, any type of felony, you were excluded from getting one of those agent cards. So you were excluded from working in the Nevada cannabis industry, at least directly with the products. Yeah. Um, and so that was a huge disadvantage for a lot of people, especially in Nevada, where um, I don't even think Texas had a cannabis law this strict by any, uh, you know, at any point. But in Nevada, any cannabis possession at all was an instant felony. Like, I don't even think Texas has a policy that severe for first time, like any possession. Only concentrates. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. With concentrates, I could see that. But in, uh, in Nevada, originally the law, that was that. So it was instantly a felony. So imagine how many people were convicted of felony charges back then who now can't work in the cannabis industry or until recently couldn't work. Um, you know, so that was a huge issue about with overregulation. Um, just other ways, too. Um, and they're uh, finally opening the consumption lounges slowly but surely the law passed two years ago in the 2021 session um but regulations are still being worked out licenses are slowly starting to be handed out um there's a lot of committee discussions a lot of thought and uh expertise put into the crafting of these regulations so i like to think when the consumption lounges do open it'll be you know, hugely successful, especially for a city like Vegas that has millions of tourists. I like to think it'll be a huge tourist attraction as well. I mean, think about a weed bar, essentially. You know, you can just meet up at a huge location and just share joints and bongs and, you know, dab, uh, you know, content. Amen. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, this is what's interesting is that, like, there are a lot of people who don't necessarily have alcohol at home. But they'll go out and have a drink, you know what I'm saying, at a bar, you know. And, the, and I think the same is true. There's probably a lot of people who don't want to carry cannabis products at home. But if they're out and about, you know, they don't mind stopping by a bar, taking a dab hit, going about their business, right? Yeah. Oh, certainly. Yeah, I know plenty of people who don't consume every day, you know, every minute like they're snooping, you know, Willie. But... You know, when they're, if they're out with friends or they're at a party, oh, they might take a little hit of a joint or, you know, a little hit of a vape pen or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's definitely those social smokers that I feel like would benefit from going to a consumption lounge. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it'll definitely be a huge uh, tourist attraction, hopefully. Um, yeah. Especially in Vegas and Reno as well. I definitely feel like for uh, for both cities, it'll be huge. Um, it's just a matter of when they'll open and everything like that. It's, you know, and I'm sure there'll be a bunch of initial issues that arise when the consumption lounge is open. I'm sure, I'm sure it'll be, you know, all the craze. It, it, it's, it's Vegas. It's the city is, uh, growing rapidly. I've never, like, even in Dallas, the city wasn't growing this big. There's just every year there's <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you haven't been here in a while, Josh. <laughs> man, I'm telling you, man, it's in, huge now, I've man. Been in for a while now, unfortunately. 
but no, even when I was living in Dallas, it was it was crazy how, how like big and fast everything was growing. But just Vegas is always coming out with some world changing attraction or world changing venue to check out. Yeah. So I'm sure you've seen the Sphere, right? Yeah. yeah. The yeah. Sphere, yeah. That's going to be huge. Um, and so it's like that, you know. So Vegas is always putting itself once again on the map in one way or another. And I feel like at least with cannabis tourism in the very niche market, um, it'll definitely put itself on the map with these consumption lounges. Hopefully. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm being, you know, slightly optimistic here. When I say that, I hope they're, you know, beneficial for the industry. Because sure. Nevada cannabis, the whole industry across all the legal states, except for the few that just recently legalized, are suffering. A no. Layoffs are common um throughout i mean even like leafly dutchy like a uh, cannabis ancillary companies they're facing layoffs like a lot of dozens and dozens of people are getting laid off from these really big cannabis and cannabis ancillary companies because it's just it's an economic downturn right now unfortunately it's just we're not in the best spot economically as in the entire american economy um and so less people are purchasing at the dispensaries um and so as a result, sales are down. So, you know, corners need to be cut. And it's unfortunate. Um, yeah. And so that's why I'm hoping opportunities like the consumption lounges um, and hopefully uh, like portable venue. So like portable venue licenses, basically you, you'd be able to sell cannabis at a music festival, essentially, or at public events, you could sell yeah. cannabis. Um, like opportunities like that. There are other ways that I feel like laws could be passed to further allow for future opportunities within cannabis. So when sales go down, like right now, there will be those opportunities for the industry to bounce back. And I feel yeah. like the consumption lounges, the uh, portable use, those opportunities like that, I feel like could be phenomenal opportunities. It's just the the laws need to pass, the lounges need to actually open, like these these opportunities and these possibilities, they need to be enacted. Laws need to be passed. They sound great on paper and I'm all supportive of them, but until the laws are passed and so the lawmakers do something. You, know? you, you recently were traveling to Carson City for the session, right? Yep, yeah. Um, well, how far the, away is that? Carson City is a good six, seven hour drive. God. <laughs> me and uh, yeah, another cannabis uh, activist I know of here, he runs a like testing cannabis science lab, sort of. Really interesting, really um, great guy, uh, knows so much about cannabis science. Yeah, him and me, him and his van, and we just blasted some old country music and took the seven hour drive out there, out to Reno. Yeah, we stayed at a hotel in Reno. Um, so the drive was a little longer. Carson City's a little south of Reno. So the drive was a little longer because we were going up to Reno. But yeah, we went up to Carson City um me and it was with the chamber of cannabis um uh, the nevada chamber of cannabis out here it's the like the premier trade organization out here for cannabis i'm their in-house journalist as well phenomenal organization i love all the opportunities the organization has given me all the articles i've gotten to written about them um all the people i've met phenomenal organization and um so we all went up there it was like 25 almost 30 people and we all went up there and the big bill that we were advocating for was uh, Senate Bill 277, which would double the daily limit uh, purchase of uh, what you're allowed to purchase in Nevada dispensaries. Right now, Nevada, another reason it's strictly uh, regulated is because the daily purchasing limits is you can only right now and until this bill passed, you could only purchase one ounce of flour or 3.5 grams of concentrate or 3,500 milligrams of concentrate. So that means, you know, vape pens. So you can only purchase a few vape pens, one ounce of flour. So for those who purchase a lot, it's rather restrictive. Right. And, you know, when you look at states like Maine that also have legal cannabis, you can purchase two and a half ounces in Augusta, Maine. Yeah, in Branson, Missouri, you can purchase two and a half ounces. How, um, how, how much alcohol can you purchase in Nevada? I as don't much know. as you want. Yeah, I don't know if those laws exist here. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like the laws against prostitution. I'm like, wait, 
it's illegal. It is like, it's, it, it's like that it's Vegas. So it's, you know, everything is that is sinful is legal in one way or another out here. Um, and it, it really has become a huge city for cannabis. Luckily it really has. Um, and so I feel very fortunate about that, that there is always something to do, something to cover, uh, someone to talk to, someone who's launching a new product or passing a new bill. But yeah, so this uh, Nevada Senate bill, yeah, it would double the daily limits. And it would also further allow people who've been convicted of felonies to have more access to work in the industry as well. So it wasn't just only for the industry. It was a you know criminal justice reform bill to an extent as well. So we went up there and we went to a Senate committee hearing about the bill. Um, the senator who authored the bill spoke at that meeting and we lobbied with her and, you know, met her and I don't know if lobbied with her is the proper use of verb, but she helped us tremendously with passing the bill and sponsoring it and helping the industry. Uh, her name's Senator Dallas Harris. She's a phenomenal leader in Dallas. In, Love that uh, name. In Dallas, sorry, mm. in Vegas. Um, and, and yeah, she's great and she's helped the industry, you know, so, so much. It, it's, it's great that there are uh, officials out here who uh, care about the industry. And so, yeah, she, she helped us out tremendously with uh, meeting people and the legislatures and talking to them and saying why the bill would be great, as well as all the uh, criminal justice reform elements as well and how it would help with employment numbers in the industry and give people more and, opportunities. To work and you got industry. that bill passed, right? Yeah, it passed, uh, signed into law, signed by uh, former sheriff Joe Lombardo, who's the governor now. A Republican sheriff who's the governor of Nevada signed that bill. Hmm. So there's, you know, there's bipartisanship there. So it was a great day. I'm glad I got to go up to Carson City and see it, you know, go walk the halls of the Capitol building and sure. see a law be discussed and eventually signed into law. Just that whole process as a journalist who covers law and politics. It was an amazing opportunity. And I'm glad I was there to witness it all. It was neat because I think we were also in, we were also at the Capitol during this time in Texas. <laughs> and yeah. so it's, it's really neat to see, you know, your journey, what, you know, your contributions to Texas, but also in your, your new home state of Nevada, uh, making an impact there. And so uh, we're about to go on a break. But on the other side, I would like to bring the discussion back to Texas and probably and maybe ga gather some of your hot takes on on Texas, because I know you're definitely keeping an eye on things that are happening here. Oh, absolutely. All right, then. So we're going to go back to another sponsor break. And when we come back, we're going to do just that. We're going to bring the conversation from Vegas all the way back to Texas and, and get Josh's take on on what he thinks we had happen here in the session here. Uh, I'd be interested to hear his take on that. And then, you know, whatever else Austin's got in mind as well. Right <laughs> after this. You should attend the Fuck Cancer Party. It's a fundraiser for some patients. Lady Zan's party where you bring a friend with you. It's being hosted by Mary J. July 29th is the day. 6 to 9 p.m. You should head out that way. 2110 South Lamar, Austin, Texas ain't that far. You could get there in your car and bring a friend. You can get tickets and information if you go on the browser and visit our website. Visit texascanico.com forward slash events. Find out more information and buy tickets. Join us on August 17th for the Texas Cannabis Roundup in Fort Worth, Texas at the Longhorn Ice House. This will be an industry networking event featuring speakers in a robust Texas style venue. The event starts at 5.15 p.m. and will last until 9.45 p.m. Visit TexasCannabisRoundup.com to get tickets today. So you can join us at the Longhorn Ice House on August 17th at 5 p.m. Howdy, Colt Power here. These days, many people are choosing to add CBD to their wellness routine. 
Why? Some like CBD for how it may help them with their focus. Others enjoy the way the plant compound may assist them with their sore muscles and relaxation. For me, CBD has been a game changer in keeping my old sports injuries managed so I can work out and be present for my family. If you've ever been curious about CBD, I invite you to check out our Texas-grown, Texas-made products at PowerBioFarms.com. That's Power, B-I-O-P-H-A-R-M-S.com. Thrive Apothecary offers an experience truly unique from anything else in Texas. A full-service cannabis solution that is doctor-owned and offers customers every level of cannabis legally available in Texas. From traditional CBD products to emerging hemp-derived THC edibles, smokables, and now medical cannabis. As a licensed medical cannabis provider, prospective patients from anywhere in Texas can book a sponsored online eligibility consultation to determine if they qualify for a medical marijuana prescription from the comfort of their own home. Visit thrivetx.com for more information. Welcome back to the Lone Star Collective Podcast, the official podcast of the Texas Cannabis Collective, distributed on Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, and many more to give Texans information regarding policy, industry, and culture. And now, Back to this week's show. Welcome back to the Lone Star Collective, the official podcast of the Texas Cannabis Collective. I'm your host, Chris Grisolia, and I'm joined this week by our co-host, Austin Zamariri, and our board member guest, Josh Kassoff, all the way from Las Vegas, Nevada. Welcome back, guys. Las Vegas. Real quick, want to clarify, Josh is our secretary. Again, he's a founding board member. Absolutely. There were four of us, me, Josh, uh, Jesse, and Lauren. We were the original four. Uh, Sarah, too, but Sarah stepped away from the board before we completed all of the documentation and paperwork. And so um, Josh, all the way in Vegas, was very dedicated long before we formed a board. And we formed the board. He's been a board member ever since. Now, gosh, now we're going on almost two years of being a fully formed 501c4 nonprofit organization here in Texas. Um, so, again, Josh, thank you, man. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being it's, here, brother. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be part of the collective. It's an honor to do cannabis journalism like I do. All right, let's talk Texas. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I know there wasn't very much movement this session when it comes to cannabis in Texas, unfortunately, but I mean, Texas is essentially when what happens with cannabis uh, law and legislative matters is this is what happens when there is no ballot initiative in a state, essentially, because if, you know, Texas had a ballot initiative, the citizens collected signatures for a ballot to be put on, you know, the next statewide election, you know, similar to how other states have legalized it, um, like Florida or, you know, Florida will be voting in 2024 because the citizens started a ballot. They collected the signatures. Secretary of State, you know, uh, you know, made sure everything was correct, and so it'll be on the ballot in November of 2024. You know, so Florida will be voting for that, you know, because they have ballot initiative. But I really feel like if Texas had ballot initiative, cannabis would have been legalized years ago. Certainly, because certainly. You know, you know, you know, even in a state that's still decently red like Texas, there's a tremendous amount of cannabis reform when it comes to uh, for the, almost all Texans, really. I mean, you look at all the young conservatives, the young Republicans that are very much in support of cannabis reform. Remember the piece I did with uh, Houston Young Republicans a couple of years ago? You know, this was, what, 2019? So this is yeah. a number of years ago now. And, you know, of course, Dan Patrick saying no bill will ever get passed in the Senate. You know, cannabis reform will never happen in Texas. And that's when they said, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, we're in the same party and we disagree with your stance. You know, and they off they offered to speak with Lieutenant Governor Patrick. Um, but, you know, obviously, you know, because there's no ballot initiative, we have to rely on the legislatures. The Texans do. The, yep. They have to rely on their legislatures for uh, any reform at all in the state, for any matter. And uh, and as a result, there's very little movement when it comes to cannabis reform because the all the cannabis reform bills passed the House with a pretty good majority, right? Yep. 
at least you know decent amount of conservatives vote in favor of it. Yep. Um, and then you know, and that's great. You know, the, the all the decriminalization bills, medical expansion bills, like it's great that they pass the House. But once they get to the Senate, that's when Dan Patrick takes over, and it, it's just it's I don't want to call it a dictatorship, but it, it, it's it's not far. <laughs> I, yeah, it's ridiculous how power drunk he is. I've never seen a, an elected official just be this openly and blatantly power drunk. It's it, it's astounding. Um, yeah. And then then Ken Paxton too. You know the state attorney general. <laughs> that guy's he, got. He's in a world of uh, hurt right yeah, now. Yeah. Talk about <laughs> impeached by his own party. Uh, yeah. So he's. Yeah, he's occupied with a lot of other matters right now. <laughs> but Josh, it's funny because we were talking about Ken Paxton years ago, and you, in fact, you wrote a, you went on a full on, you know, I don't want to say a hit piece or anything like that, but you, you laid it out all out on the line on a Ken Paxton oh, yeah. piece. I remember, all and the, so many previous attorney generals of Texas have. I mean, there was, I think, there was the attorney general before Cornyn. Uh, he ended up committing like a million dollars worth of fraud. And so he went to prison for years and he was the attorney general of Texas or it's something like that. Yeah. It was like a fraud case. And yeah, he went to like jail for years because of it. And he was the attorney general of Texas. So it's like that. I mean, um, yeah, there's been so many instances where, you know, attorney generals of Texas do not act by the law. I mean, there's a lot of attorney generals who have broken the law. But in Texas, it's just it, with Ken Paxton. I mean, he's he was indicted on fraud charges already. And I mean, you can find his mugshot. And just the fact that he's still the attorney general in one re-election, like that yeah. guy, when someone who clearly broke the I don't say clearly broke law innocent until proven guilty, but like you know, when people who show low low moral character like that and clearly don't listen to their constituents um when they're in power still that that's when i feel like it bothers me when the people's voices are at least not being considered um yeah. that, that's when i feel like democracy loses its power is when people like that who don't listen to their constituents at all don't listen to their party members at all who have their views on a subject and they're just going to act on those views and no one else's viewpoints or stories no matter how personal can change those viewpoints. Um, you know, how many Texas legislatures just, or, uh, you know, uh, representative members or senators uh, just won't vote for any cannabis reform, like Pete Sessions, you know? Like who, no matter how many stories he heard from the many advocates, you know, the many diverse advocates that Texas has um, about, can you know, how cannabis helped their children in some cases. Mm -hmm. No matter what, they just will not budge. Their their opinions will not change. It, it's legislators like that that bother me. That have no sense of empathy, no sense of sympathy, no sense of any sort of emotional, you know, understanding. Yeah. And so that's what bothers me is that um, I, I don't know how you can hear the story about you know Alexis Bortel, for instance. Um, you know, a twelve year old who whose life was basically saved from cannabis. She was having all these seizures. And then she, you know, t uh, started using cannabis oil. Her parents had to leave Texas. She was from Texas. Her parents had to move and her family had to move to Colorado. And so she got her cannabis oil. And so she's been, I think, seizure free ever since. Yeah. And so it's people like that, you know, and the many other families who have found uh, uh, medical relief from cannabis, but are doing it illegally, technically, such as Texas, such as the other illegal states. Yeah. Um, you know, and hearing those stories, the fact that legislators can hear those stories mm -hmm. and just not budge at all on the subject, that, that just concerns me. That's, that's, it, it does worry me. Um, and no, Texas isn't alone on that. I feel like there's a lot of other lawmakers who refuse to hear any sort of testimony on how medical cannabis can be effective. I mean, there are veterans, there are parents who have children who have found relief through medical cannabis. There's people like me who had, you know, some mental health issues that I was going through at one point and cannabis helped me, you know, an incredible amount. Um, everyone has their story why they use medical cannabis and 
And the fact that lawmakers can just disregard all those stories, all those testimonies and say, oh, well, you know, these drugs that have clearly proven to be ineffective, oh, we'll just keep trying them and maybe they'll work. But no, this plant that clearly works for you. No, that's that's evil. That's, you know, yeah. no, that's a gateway drug. You can't do that. That's a controlled substance like that. Just that that dichotomy, that that very warped misunderstanding of plants versus pharmaceuticals. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not a medical expert, so I'm not going to say, oh, you know, get completely off your pharmaceuticals and go to cannabis entirely because I'm not a doctor. And if someone does have more relief through pharmaceuticals, then okay, you know, that that's their choice and sure. it, works, it works for them. But at the same time, I will always advocate for the option of cannabis because there are a lot of cases where cannabis does help more than the pharmaceuticals. It just does. Well, let me, can I expand on that real quick? Because yeah. now that I'm working at Thrive Apothecary, um, in my experience, we have a lot of people, I would say 50% of the people that come in, um, especially those who are new to cannabis, they're coming in because it's a last resort. They've, they've used XYZ pill, they've seen ABC doctor, and they found no relief. And they can't sleep. They're in chronic pain. Oh, They're order. hurting. They're hopeless. Yeah. And they they don't care about the stigma anymore. And they're just coming in because they heard that maybe CBD or Delta Eight or whatever, you know, will make them might make them feel better in that it's non toxic, like like the pills they're taking. So they come in. They try the product. They find relief. They come back, and they're in tears because they're it you know for the first time they're getting the best night of sleep they've had in 20 yeah. years they're getting yeah. uh relief from chronic pain that has been that they've been experiencing for a decade and yeah. and what's even more painful is to see the clock kind of turning in their mind like why didn't i start here why didn't i start yeah. with plant-based medicine as opposed to let's be honest the petrol patient to pill pipeline um it that that is a very real thing that is the way that our our institution of medical care exists is the patient to pill pipeline yeah and cannabis doesn't fit in there absolutely oh the, the patient to pill pipeline that's that's unfortunately very real yeah you know and and you know you uh you know, cases like Purdue Pharma with OxyContin, you know, that level of patient to pill um, was was insane. Um, and so you know, that's why I have my distrust with pharmaceuticals, frankly. Yeah. Uh, but that's just me. That's why I don't use pharmaceuticals. That's why it's, it's only cannabis for me. Um, but that's just because it works for me. You know, it, it's it just it does, um, you know, for lack of a better uh, term. It, it helps me in ways that, you know, pharmaceuticals and every other way that I've tried just doesn't. It, it provides me with an amazing amount of, like, mental clarity, mental, like, not the opposite of, like, you know, thinking fast all the time. Like, my brain runs very fast, I feel like. And cannabis just helps slow it down to a manageable speed. And so that's why, that's why I will always prefer cannabis. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to make any like medical calls like that. If someone says, should I switch off my pharmaceuticals entirely? I say, I, I, I don't know. Please speak with the doctor about that. Um, but yeah. just with my, with my personal experience, I prefer cannabis and more natural remedies. Um, uh, but that's just me. I'm, I'm big on like choice and, uh, you know, if something works for you, try it. If not, then don't, you know? Um, but with me, yeah. cannabis works more than anything. Um, and I'm really glad to be, uh, you know, a medical patient in a state that has a medical program and a recreational program. I'm glad that yeah. I've made an all right living from coming out here and getting employed in the industry and hitting the ground running with that. And uh, just instantly getting connected. It's Vegas, so there's always an event to cover. There's always a festival to go to. There's always a person to talk to. Um, a release of a product or any sort of, you know, a big event like that. There's just always something to do in this city. So as a journalist, there's always something to report on. So I'm very yeah. fortunate. 
Yeah. Well, and, and not just that, but you're you continue to show your dedication to your home state, and that yeah. even though you might be thousand plus miles away, yeah. uh, you you still very much care about your home state, and that you're willing to contribute and spend and sacrifice time and and um, keep up to date. And so, you know, we appreciate you. All, I always appreciate you, and I'm thankful Absolutely. because, um, you know, we we have we're still very much engaged as an organization. Post session, we're working on a college station decriminalization campaign. We're working on a Lubbock decriminalization campaign. We're still embedded in the Denton decriminalization campaign, um, and you know, you wrote on decriminalization there, and I'm pretty sure that as we go along. Uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to see some Josh Kassoff material coming about out about these other campaigns that are happening across the state. Thank you. It's an honor. Yeah. And, and I do see uh, cannabis legalization happening in Texas eventually. It's just, you know, the Dan Patricks and the, you know, the politicians, like I mentioned, who are drunk on power and see things only their way, have no lack, uh, no, have no sense of empathy. Um, just, you know, who don't care about any sort of cannabis reform, they'll they'll be eventually not in power anymore. And more pro-cannabis uh, representatives, especially conservatives as well, because younger conservatives yeah. are way more pro-cannabis. When younger sure. conservatives are in power, that's when the big cannabis reforms will happen in Texas. Absolutely. Like. Yeah. So Josh, it, we can. We're, happen, yeah. Josh, we're going to wrap this up here. If you can plug... Plug whoever, plug wherever you're at, how people can find you, where they can um, follow you. Follow me on Instagram. Uh, it's at, at Captain Kassoff. Captain, like Captain Morgan, uh, my last name, Kassoff. Um, follow me there. I post my articles there. I have a link tree as well. Um, it's My Instagram handle is um, same thing. I, I write, uh, follow the Chamber of Cannabis, if you can, in Nevada. Great organization. Uh, very well connected. Uh, you know, very instrumental in some phenomenal change in the state. Absolutely. A uh, great organization full of some fantastic advocates and professionals. Um, so I definitely recommend following them and staying up to date with what they're doing. Um, follow the collective, of course. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm going to keep covering what's going on in Nevada. I write for Cannabis Now as well. Um, so follow me there. Hell yeah, uh, dude. Doing great big great things. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Vegas Cannabis Magazine, Tahoe Cannabis Magazine, if you're in the Tahoe cool. area. Um, yeah, great magazines to follow what's going on locally, boots on the ground within Las Vegas and Reno. It's very, that's why I like writing for Vegas Cannabis. It's very, like, uh, you know, like I mentioned that boots on the ground, it's very much written by people who are involved in the industry, involved in advocacy, involved in lawmaking. So yeah. it's a really interesting magazine to read. So definitely read that if you can. Um, I sometimes cover what's going on in some other states as well. Just other random stories too. Vegas is full of some celebrities. So I've had the honor of interviewing The Godfather, the wrestler, Rob Van Dam, um, a couple other wrestlers here and there. I have some in mind I want to interview. I mean, um, hell, you, you interviewed Ag Commissioner Sid Miller, baby. Yep, Sid Miller, a lot of politicians. Um the speaker of the Nevada House uh, House Assembly, I'm used to Texas. It's the Nevada Assembly, not House of Representatives. Um, the Nevada Assembly, his name's Steve Yeager. Uh, definitely follow him. He's been very, very, uh, very, very big with cannabis change. And he was the sponsor behind the uh, consumption lounge bill, the one that authorized the lounges to open. Um, he's been a huge advocate for uh, the industry. Um, so definitely follow him. Senator Dallas Harris, who signed the most recent bill that will help the industry a lot, uh, follow her. Yeah, there's a lot that's going on in Nevada, a lot with Vegas, the consumption lounges. I recommend everyone stay up to date on that. That'll be huge for uh, not only Nevada cannabis, but just tor cannabis tourism in general, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, recommend staying up to date on all of that. <clears throat> um, follow me, follow the collective. Um, there's so much that's going on. Um, with cannabis in America, really, and internationally too. So definitely, if yeah. you you know Germany might be legalizing soon. Um, there's 
you know, there's there was a recent big cannabis conference in Berlin. Um, so yeah, Germany is going to be a big country to legalize soon. There's internationally, there's a lot of efforts as well. So one of these days, we're going to get you down here at some point in Texas. Yes. With the group all together as one. Yes. Uh, and then maybe you know there's what? a chance that some of us show up in Vegas for Biz BizCon. So we're going to get our group group picture. Um, you know, for anybody who's been following along over the years, you've seen all of us together, you know, you know, or most of the group together, as far as our board members are concerned, um, in different venues, different places, different events. Um, and it's always kind of a different mix of all of us. Um, but Josh would really love to get you in one of those because yeah. your contributions to our team are invaluable. And so we appreciate your time here, man. Thank you. Know? you. Yeah. It was an honor to hop on the podcast. Um, this is a great podcast. I've been listening to a bunch of it. We've, it, it's seriously great how many different people we've gotten on the podcast who, you know, advocates, uh, representatives, everyone, you know, yep. so it, it, yeah. So it's, it's been an honor to see the collective grow from just a few people to this podcast to interviewing all these high ranking and really important people. So it's, it, yeah. it's been a fun ride. I'm looking forward to writing a lot more with the collective and a lot more just following with Canvas Journal. You know, we're definitely looking forward to seeing more from you because you, you do yeah. some great work. I'm very honored. So it, it's yeah, it's been a yeah, it's been a it's been a lot of fun. Well, that being said, we're going to wrap it up for this show, folks. Uh, it's, we could probably talk to Josh for hours on end, especially <laughs> about the whole Vegas scene. It's pretty wild out there from what I hear and from what he's been, been telling <laughs> us about. But uh and unfortunately, we have to wrap it up, folks. So if you enjoyed this show, we put on a show almost every week. So join us again and, and spread the word about the Lone Star Collective podcast because we're spreading the word about cannabis in Texas. And we thank you for joining us. <laughs>